Jesus, we love our kiddos. <laughs> we love our kids. A church without kids is a dead church. Amen, because that's the future generation. Hallelujah. Well, I'm glad you're here. Are you glad to be at Hosanna Christian Fellowship? Come on, give Jesus one more hand of praise. One other thing that we have to do before we switch gears here. What time is it? Praise God. Almost 11. Well, praise the Lord. We are going to hurry as quickly as we can because I know the man of God has a word in his heart. Um, Brother uh, Glenn and Miss Shelley Powers, would you come forward this morning? And these are some precious individuals. Uh, I've told them for two weeks that we would do this. And they love their pastor and they put up with me. Praise God. And so this morning, I uh, have the awesome privilege of announcing to you new members at Hosanna Christian Fellowship Church. And um, so I believe that the Lord adds to the church. Somebody said, well, what about so-and-so leaving? Or what about this? Get your eyes off people. Don't you know the nature of church? That you're always going to have those that come and go, but you're going to have those that stay. I'm not worried about the ones that, that go. I want the ones that stay. That say, Pastor, I believe in the vision. Amen. Because you can build with that. And these are people that believed in the vision. And I just love you, and I'm so honored and privileged today. I know Miss Brooks. Oh, here she is. Uh, we want to welcome you as new members at Hosanna Christian Fellowship. And uh, can somebody take a picture? Is there anything you'd like to say or? And I'm putting you on the spot, but. Um, well, I'm happy to be here as well as um, I really get to work with you guys and hear about the vision and what God is trying to do and to be here with you today. I'm honored to be with you guys and to be a village of Christ and all that you do. And if you stick around, I'm going to catch up to him someday with the beard. I don't know. Well, we love him. Give him another God bless you. They're our fam. We've spent extensive time with them, and they've just expressed that they love us, and we love them. And membership is so important. Why is it important? I know a lot of churches don't do it. It's a written commitment. It's a marriage relationship. If most people treated uh, their spouses like they treat their relationship with the church, nobody would be married. We'd have a lot of divorced people. So thank you for your commitment here and your dedication. Well, I'm honored and privileged. Would you put your hands together and welcome the bishop of the house, man of God. Hallelujah. You can use the pulpit if you want to. Well, somebody say praise the Lord. Let me try it again. Somebody say praise the Lord. Uh, that, little, that young man that was beating the wood box, do you play the drums? He may. He does. All right, can you come on and jump in the drums real quick? Nathan, can you get over there on the organ? Can we all stand up? Pastor, is this your phone? Okay. How many of you love your pastor here today? I want to say that I have our own sweet assurance from heaven that this today, tonight, Pastor told us to be prepared for whatever God wants to do. So I'll let you know that we brought extra clothes and we made allowances for extra time because we are just prepared for whatever God wants to do in this place. Amen. 
And our, our friends, uh, Pastor uh, Nick Hess and Shepherd's Heart will be here tonight with us. But last night I was praying and I was like, God, I want us to be so far out in the river of your glory this morning that when they get here tonight, they're just going to have to jump into the deep water and take off swimming to catch up with us. Amen? And I can tell you, I have it on assurance from heaven today that there are miracle signs and wonders that are going to take place. I can tell you that somebody is going to leave this place changed and their life is never going to be the same. So I'm, I'm from Texas, very soon to be transplanted to Oklahoma City. So we, we're about to join you and be in the fellow Okies with you very soon. But I'd like you to reach way down inside of you as far as you can. I want you to grab a big old breath of air. I want you to crack your head back, and I want you to shout glory as loud as you can. One, two, three, shout. Come on, that's pretty good. Let's try one more time. One, two, three, shout. Amen. I like to sing little church songs because I'm a church boy, so I want to sing a little church song. While we sing, I want you to take just a minute, cross the aisle, shake somebody's hand, and tell them there's a miracle going to take place in your life today. What? Go back to the other key. Oh, by and by, when the morning comes, when all the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we've overcome and we'll understand it better by and by. Oh, by and by, when the morning comes, when all the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we've overcome and we'll understand now come on and clap with me, come on. Clap your hands like you're not ashamed to slap the devil right in the mouth, come on. Oh, how we've overcome and we'll understand it better by and by. Come on and sing it by and by when the morning comes. When all the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we've overcome and we'll understand it better by and by. Well, trials come on every hand and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to the blessed promised land. But he promised you and I, if we'd serve him till we die, we would understand it better by and by. Come on, clap your hands. By and by, when the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathered home. We will tell the story how we've overcome and we'll understand it better by and by. Come on, one more time, everybody sing it. When all the saints, oh, we will tell the story how we've overcome and we'll understand it better by and by. Now come on and give God another big hand of praise. Amen. Amen. Uh, get your Bibles, would you please, while you're standing this morning, go to Isaiah 43 and 19. So glad to be with you this morning. Glad to be with your pastor. Uh, I'm already familiar with Hosanna, even though this is the first time you've seen me. I've already seen you on several occasions. I watched you all during revive, a camp meeting in January. I watched you almost every night. Benny Baker was here. Uh, I watched your pastor over at uh, Ufala on revival nights. And so I've become familiar with who you are. I know it's your first time to see me, but trust me, we're going to get along just fine. Amen. Glad to see our good friend, Brother, Jer 
Brother Jerry Payne here with us and his wife, Sister Payne. Glad to see them. Amen. And they, this just some awesome people. We've known them for many, many years. So uh, Nathan leaned over and said, Jerry Payne's sitting here. Well, I'm glad I didn't wear my Nigerian suit today or he'd been making fun of me wearing my pajamas to church. So I'm glad to see them here, all of you. Let's go to the Word of God, Isaiah 43. Glad to see my, my, my best man. He's not just my son. He's my, he's my friend. We're brothers in the Lord, even though we're father and son. And he's equally anointed in, the, in, in every ministry. How many of you glad to see Brother Nathan here with us this week? Amen glory. All right, let's go to Isaiah 43, and I want to tell you what I'm going to preach today is a right now word from God for you. Who knows that a word spoken in due season has power and authority? Amen. 43 and 19, Isaiah, behold, I will do a new thing, and now it shall spring forth, and shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness, and rivers in the desert, the beast of the field shall honor me and the dragons and the owls because I give water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself that they shall show forth my praise. I want to tell you today, God is going to do something miraculous in this place today. I want you to say this right now out loud with your mouth. I'm in the right place at the right time. Could you reach over to somebody, not your husband, not your wife, but somebody different and shake them by the hand. And while you're shaking it, shake them by, shake that. Come on, turn around and get them by the hand and shake their hand. And while you're shaking it, I want you to tell them, neighbor, you're in the right place at the right time. Come on, turn around to somebody on the other side one more time and just tell them, neighbor. You're in the right place at the right time. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts this morning. Lift our hands. Father, thank you for the presence of God that's in this place. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Father, I thank you that you're in this place right now. I thank you that your word will be manifested with healings, with miracles, signs, and wonders. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you that today you are here in this place. Jesus, we give you all reverence, all glory, all honor to you, the only wise God. I pray today that we hide behind the cross, see none of us and only you. Lord, I thank you today. I thank you that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, you're my strength and you're my redeemer. And we'll give you all the praise and glory for it. For you're worthy of it in Jesus' mighty name. Can somebody shout amen? Come on, one more time. Shout it amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I want you to know that I'm an amen. I'm a glory to God preacher. So if you don't say amen, I'll have to say all of them by myself. Somebody's going to say amen today. Can I find an amen corner somewhere? Amen. All right. I, I want to say before we get into preaching this morning, something that the Lord laid on my heart. Somebody in here been having lower back pain? Anybody been having lower back pain? Who, who is that? If that's you, just stand up. If you can stand up, just stand up. You've been having lower back pain, and you know, Pastor talked about how long he's been in the ministry honoring God. I, I've also been in the ministry a long time honoring God. And the one thing that I've just come to is just not to worry about someone saying, well, that's generic, or people do that all the time, or, well, what about this, or what about that? I'm just going to say whatever it is God says to say and act on whatever God says to act on. And then, you know, yesterday my son was telling me about a, a lady that I prophesied to, and, and supposedly I was supposed to told her all these things. And Nathan said, do you remember that? And I'm like, no, not at all. Why? Because it was just God doing what God God does. Amen. So all of you that are standing with lower back, somebody beside them, Brother Jerry, just walk over there. Somebody right there. Brother, just turn around. Grab, grab them by the hand and just 
right there, somebody who ever sitting back there, you believe God is a healer, grab a hold of that person. And brother, are you in the back, brother Deacon? Are you standing up with lower back pain? Somebody that's got faith, walk back there to brother Deacon and just take him by the hand, take him by the, by the hand and put your hand on his lower back. Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you right now for touching your people. I thank you that your word is manifested and that healings take place right now. Take every bit of the pain away right now. Lord, I thank you that before this service leaves, a testimony that I came in one way and I'm leaving a different way. God, I trust you that this is you. I trust you that you know what is right. And I pray today that you let your power from the crown of their head to the middle of their back, down to the soles of their feet. Lord, if it's vertebrae, if it's muscles, Lord, whatever it is, Lord, I pray right now that you do this in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you that you are a healer. Thank you, you're Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God, our healer. In the name of Jesus, manifest it today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Somebody give God a shout for joy in here right now. Amen, amen. I want you to shout this loud and proud. Behold, I do a new thing. Somebody shout a new thing. How many of you know that God doesn't need to recirculate an old thing, but God can do a new thing? And how many of you know that the church is living in such an age now that all the things that some of us thought were old actually would be very new if we saw them happen again? I don't hide it that I am unashamedly, unapologetically a purebred Pentecostal kid. I was raised in a Pentecostal church. Around our pulpit was was uh, crutches and canes and and all these things with a rope. They didn't even have bungee cords. They just had them with a rope tied around the pulpit. Wheelchairs lined up down the walls. We were unashamed. I can remember on a Sunday night inviting my friends to church because I wanted to see them. I wanted them to see me play the piano at 11 or 12 years old. So my football buddies come to church on a Sunday night and church was supposed to start at 6 and about 6.10, 6.15 my dad walked over to the edge of the stage because the piano sat on the floor and he looked down at me and he said, where's your mother? And I said I don't know. And and we, he said well, he looked at my brother who played the guitar he said, well start playing something maybe they'll show up. And then somebody up in the, in the sound booth up in the top, that's how the old Pentecostal churches had the sound up in the top they pointed back there that my mom was still in the prayer room. The old women of the church that led our singing. We didn't have a choir. We had a song leader. Now our song leader was up there in the top in the prayer room. And just a few minutes later, we started singing. And, and while we're singing, the back doors of our church, much like this, just busted open. And here become my mother sitting on top of a lady who was walking down like she was crawling like a, a big brown grizzly bear. And my mother's sitting on top of her like she's riding to her for eight seconds hollering come out of her in the name of Jesus and then she shouted she got a devil and my mother rode that lady all the way down to the front of the church and they cast the demons out of her and when I looked for my friends from football all I saw was the back side of them running through the side door running out into the parking lot as fast as they could go so I am unashamed Pentecostal and if we saw the things today that many of us grew up seeing and know that God can do and know what God, how much power God really possesses, it would be a new thing in this generation. But how many of you are ready for God to do a new thing? How many of you are ready for God to manifest his power in full authority and in full strength in our generation? When God is ready to do something new, here's the wonderful thing. He doesn't call for an election. Can I get an amen? God doesn't need the church board to vote if he can do a new thing. God doesn't care what society's opinion is or if his new thing matches Barna's research group. God says when he does something new, he will do it in such a way that him and him only will get the glory for it. In the Pentecostal church, we have these glorious songs. They're very simple. 
Probably because they came from simple people who were, were sharecroppers and farmers. And, you know, my, my mother and father, my sister quit school when she was 16 years old to raise me. Because my mother had me and then four days later took me, six days later, took me to revival in a wicker basket. Because the church my mom and dad pastored was having a six or eight week revival. And, and during the day, my mother, after having me, would pull cotton bowls all day in the field and then come in at night and go straight to church. So these songs that we've raised up in the Pentecostal church are very simple. They're not deep in, in uh, uh, great melodic lines, but they're very simple. But if you listen to what they say, they're also very powerful. Who's raised in any kind of Pentecostal environment? Okay, so you ought to identify with this song. You got to move. You got to move. You got to move. You got to move. When the Lord gets ready, you got to move. You may be high. You may be low. You may be rich. You may be poor. But when the Lord gets ready, you got to move. How many of you truly have a desire in your heart for God to move in your life, in your family, in your church, in your city, in America? You want to see God move. When the Lord gets ready, you got to move. And here's what God says. Behold, I do a new thing and now it shall spring forth. But then God gives Isaiah the indicator of how you will know that this is the Lord moving. He says, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I'm still in Isaiah. The beast of the field shall honor me and the dragons and the owls because, everybody shout because. Because I give water in the wilderness and rivers in the in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. I've been on this for a while in my own life and in my own uh, way of thinking that because we have entered into this come as you are mentality in the church now. And, you know, it doesn't, we, 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 we remember back, if you were in the church, we remember back to the times when Carlton Pearson first started with the spirit of inclusion and everybody's going to heaven and everybody's going to be, it doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter if you are an atheist or a Muslim or a Christian, you're all, everyone is going to heaven. And the church said, that's not right, that's not correct, that's not doctrine. No, that's not right, but somehow the church received a different message because it was laced and threaded with something that was more familiar. And the, the church received this message called the gospel of grace. Well, I'm excited today to know that the grace of God is real. Thank you, all six of you. I said, I'm excited to know the grace of God is real. I'm excited to know that I've been saved by grace through faith. I'm excited to know that even when I didn't deserve it, Jesus died for me anyways. But he did not die for me to continue to live the way that I'd been living. He did not die so that I could continue in the paths that I'd been walking. And all of a sudden, we watch things be robbed from the church. We watch statements be taken away from the church. All of a sudden now, it's not proper. There's no etiquette to say, I'm saved, and I'm sanctified, and I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. But let me tell you today, God still wants his people to live a consecrated, holy life. His word is still true. Come out from among the world and be ye a separate people. How many of you today thank God that God is still a holy God? God is not doing new things for reprobates. It's quiet now. He said, I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going to give water in the wilderness. I'm going to give rivers in the desert. I'm going to give drink to my people. 
my chosen. How many of you in here today know for a fact you are God's people? That almost sounds like a country phrase. I'm God's people. Them are my people. I'm God's people. God is not doing new things for reprobates. He's not doing new things for disobedient children. But those who have never tasted of his goodness, but this promise is given to his people and to his children. I want to remind you of a story. Remember the story of the prodigal son. Something about this God dropped in my heart this morning at about 445 in the hotel room. And when my son, our father was like, hey, Nathan, oh, Lord, son, wake up. I got to tell somebody this. And then after he woke up, I was like, hey, you want to go to breakfast? Because I was like, man, I've been up. I've been with God. I've got to share this. We know the story of the prodigal son. First, he demanded his inheritance before his father was even dead. Then he spent his inheritance with wild and crazy, riotous, unrighteous living. As just a little boy in the Pentecostal church, a lot of people called the, that right, righteous living. It's not righteous, it's riotous. Also, we also call the Dakes Bible the Dakes Anointed Bible. Well, it's called the Anatoted Bible. But people couldn't read very well, and they called it Dake's Anointed Bible. That's why I got one, because it's anointed. It says it right here on the cover. But his living wasn't righteous. It was riotous. It was ungodly. It was unrighteous. And he, he finds himself broke, living and eating with the, with the swine. In other words, he's not only broken co of covenant with his family, but he is even now broken covenant with his God. For him to even be in the swine's pit, for him to even be dealing with the pigs was a covenant breaker for him. He said to himself, I'm going to arise and I'm going to go back to my father's house. And I'm going to beg my father at least receive me as a servant because even the servants live better than I live. And on his way back to the father's house, you know this story, the father's watching and he sees him afar off and the father runs to meet him and looking, smelling like the pigs, looking like he's been living with the pigs. The father grabs his son. He embraces him. He kisses him on the neck. He says, this my son that was dead, he is yet alive. How many of you are thankful today that the Father saw you and received you to himself? Oh, my goodness. On his way back, the Father finds out, this is my son. He's alive. And then he gives them this command. Put sandals on his feet. Give him a bath. Put sandals on his feet. Put a ring on his finger. Put the best clothes on his body. My son that's dead, he's yet alive. Who in here today is glad that when the father saw you, he didn't reject you, but he received you to himself? Who in here today is glad that when the father saw you, that he didn't just receive you, but he restored you back to sonship? This morning, sitting there at the, in the little couch there in the hotel room, the Lord began to deal with me about he not only received him, but he restored him. When he said, give him a bath, put sandals on his feet, put a ring on his finger, put a robe on him, he was restoring him back to sin. It's not just enough for you to live like a servant. You're my child. You're going to be restored back to sonship. Let me tell you, if God... God loves his servants so much that his servants are without, don't do without. And his servants don't hunger and they don't starve and they don't beg. How much more is God going to do for his children? He said to us, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly father, how much more does your heavenly Father, well, eyes not seen, ears not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of a man 
what God has prepared for them that love him. Who in here today loves the Lord? Come on, where are you today? Who in here loves the Lord? Who in here loves him? I love the Lord. He heard my cry. He pitied every groan. As long as I live and troubles rise, I'll hasten to his throne. Who's thankful today that you made your way to Calvary? Who's thankful today that wretched and untun, you made your way to that cross and the blood of a bleeding, dying Savior washed over you? And though your sins are scarlet, they are now whiter than snow. Who's thankful you've been washed in the blood, redeemed by the power of God, and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Why don't you give God a big hand of praise in here today? Somebody shout, he restored him. And while I'm sitting there thinking and meditating on that this morning, God drops this in my spirit. Ten lepers cried out to Jesus. And the Bible said that they, they cried with a loud voice to Jesus. Have mercy on us. No pride. Have mercy on us. It's really easy not to have pride when you're a, a leper. Really easy to not be prideful when you've been rebuked and scorned by society. Really easy not to have pride when the world looks at you as if you're a reject the scum of the earth. My wife and I were holding a revival in a little town off by Corsicana in Texas called Frost, Texas. Then in this little bitty town, talking a little bitty, y'all, there wasn't even a red light. There wasn't a grocery store. There was a convenience store. But thank God you could get a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk in that convenience store. And in that little town, we started a revival at a little church that had a total on the first night of 11 people, counting my wife and I. Nathan wasn't even born yet. And in that service, God did such mighty things with those nine people that by the next night, by Sunday, there was almost 90 people. We went from nine to 90. By Monday night, we outgrown the church. Tuesday night, this is an old-fashioned Pentecostal church. Tuesday night, they'd raised the windows, and people were sitting out on the hoods of their cars as far out as you could see. Every night that we gave the altar call, the door of the church would open up, and people would be flooding coming into the church from outside. But on this Thursday night, there was a man there named Tracy. Tracy was the most rejected, despised person in the community because Tracy was the number one drug dealer in that whole area, not just in that town, but he serviced all that area. But somebody had told Tracy something's happening at that church, and Tracy had pushed his way in until he found a seat on the back row. I can't even tell you tonight, today, what I preached that night. But when I was finished preaching, I said one thing. If you want to know this man named Jesus, come down here right now and I'll introduce him to you. And the first person in the front of the church was Tracy. I prayed with him. He repented of his sins. He received the Lord Jesus Christ as the king of his life, the Lord of his life. And then I said, Tracy, God has something else called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He said, what is it? I said, it's fire on the inside. He said, what does it do? It'll make you cry. It'll make you shout. It'll make you dance. It'll make you run. It'll give you something that you never had. I said, Tracy, it'll be better than any drug you ever took. He said, I want it. I laid hands on this unchurched, unknowing, non-religious person. And before I could even stop praying, he was already speaking in an unknown tongue. He didn't need tutoring. He didn't need helping. The power of God had manifested on the inside. 
He started shaking. I said, what do you feel, Shay? He said, I feel like I have fire shut up in my boat. I said, what do you do? He said, I feel like run. I said, run. So he started running in the packed out little church, lap after lap after lap. When he got to the back of the building, he leaned on the wall. He started jumping up and down like a bullfrog. And he started doing this. He didn't know to say hallelujah. He didn't know to say glory to God. He didn't know to say wow like R.W. Shemach. He said. And then he said one of the most powerful things I've still yet to hear in church. Cocaine never felt this good. Dear Lord, you mean God's going to do that? That's a new thing. He's not putting fresh wine, new wine into old wineskins. He's not pouring fresh oil into old wineskins. Because if he does, those wineskins will burst and the oil will spill out. But he's looking for someone who said, Lord, I'm going to lay all my previous religious things down. God in heaven. Lord, I'm going to allow you to do something. Can I say it like this? Lord, do something that will blow my mind. It will blow my natural carnal thinking mind. I was invited by a friend of mine named uh, Brother Jones to come to his he called it a, a revival building. He was evangelist, and God allowed him to buy this nightclub. And Brother Jones rejoiced that he was taking back the devil's stuff. And he bought this nightclub and turned it into a place that he would have preachers come in and put on camp meetings all year long. And he called me. He said, hey, I want you to come. I'm bringing one of my old friends in. He said, now, I don't know if you've ever seen her or heard of her, but she's out there. He's like, he always called me son. Son, you ain't seen no one like her if you've not seen her before. I said, what's her name? He said, her name is Ruth Hef Ward Heflin. And I said, okay. He said, well, it's going to be different. I said, all right. So I get to church with my family. We all drive. My mom, who's Went to heaven, my brother-in-law, my sister, Pastor, my wife, Pastor Linda, Nathan, we all drive. We're sitting in the back of this building. It's packed out. Old people knew who she was because Brother Benny Hinn had just moved to Dallas then. That's how long ago this was. His wife and, uh, and an entourage of about 25 people were right on the front row because he had been following her since the days of Catherine Kuhlman. Her family had been involved in every stage of Pentecost. Her great-grandmother was actually born in a tent in the stables of the Azusa Mission during the Azusa Street Revival. Her mother and father, brother, brother and sister Heflin, were, were actually worked for the, what I call the greats, Jack Coe and A.A. Allen. Lester Summerall, they had worked for these men as just associate ministers and had been in all these services with them. And I looked, sitting on the stage next to Brother Jones, was the most unorthodox woman I'd seen. I felt like I was in a time machine, took back to my little Pentecostal church I was raised in, sitting there like in 1970-something. On the stage was this woman who weighed about 450 pounds, about six foot three, the biggest woman I've ever seen in my life that had about a two foot tall beehive on the top of her head. No makeup, no earrings, no lipstick, her dress all the way to the ground. And my wife leaned over to me, she said, Do you think that that's Sister Ruth? I said, God, I hope so, because I'm hoping somebody didn't come to church like this on purpose. 
Because we didn't know who she was. He then announced Sister Ruth and said, Sister Ruth's going to come to take over now. When Sister Ruth gets to the stage, to the, to the pulpit, she says, I like to sing this little song before I minister. I learned it when I was pastoring in Israel for 18 years. She said, oh, the glory, glory, glory. It's falling, falling, falling. It's falling, falling, falling on me. Oh, the glory, glory, glory. It's falling, falling, falling. Well, trust me, these Pentecostal musicians, they were wrecking. And finally she turned to them and said, just stop. Just let me sing. Brother Jones sees me in the back of the building, and he starts doing this. And my wife said, Brother Jones wants you to come up to the stage. And I said, no way. That sounds like a Hebrew chant. I'm from Texas. I don't know how to play Hebrew music. And Brother Jones was persistent. And finally he shouted, come, come on. <laughs> and boy, when those elders get you, you better come on. And that's how I met John Parrish. Nathan was 11 days old, and I was sitting on the back wall of the fellowship hall at camp meeting under window number two. And someone had told Brother Parrish that I was an organ player. And the altar call had started, and there was a prophet named Brother Vernon who could prophesy over everybody in that whole building. And Brother Vernon told a whole church empty out against the wall, and he was going to prophesy over every single person. And Pastor John looked, somebody told him I was an organ player. He looked back there and he said, come on. And I, my wife said, he looks like he's wanting you. And I said, he don't even know us. She said, but he's pointing at you. And I said, he's not pointing at us. He don't know us. Because we're on the wall against the, against the sheetrock when I say on the wall. And he keeps on pointing. And finally he asked somebody to go back there and said, Pastor John wants you to come to the stage. And I said to that person, he don't know us. They said, he said, come on. How old are you, Nathan? 28. So 28 years ago, I walked up on the stage at Lighthouse. Pastor John said, he didn't say, bless you. What's your name? He said, get on the organ. <laughs> I sat down on the organ. He put a mic on a boom stand. He said, start singing and don't stop till I tell you to. 28 years ago, when service was over, he walks up to me and says, what are you doing this week? I said, going back to Ardmore. I lived in Ardmore. He said, go home, get all your stuff, and bring it back. I want you here tomorrow night. So when Brother Joe said, get up here, I'm remembering that the elders don't quite take rejection very well. So I make my way. Come on, Pastor, you know what I'm talking about. I make my way up to the stage. I get over to the piano. I start trying to fumble my way through with Sister Ruth. And all of a sudden, Sister Ruth finds her groove, and I find it with her. Oh, the glory, glory, glory. It's falling, falling, falling. It's falling, falling, falling on me. I think I switched keys. But anyhow, Sister Ruth then all of a sudden says, wave your hands. Here comes the glory. Wave your hands. Here comes the manifestation of God. And I'm sitting there like, what's wrong? Like I'm seeing something. Like my eyes are seeing something. Because every time I would look up to the ceiling, it looked like what would appear to be gold dust, gold glitter falling through the ceiling tiles. I've been in the presence of God until I saw the Shekinah glory so thick until it looked like the church was on fire. Not just me, like some preachers say. There's the Shekinah. I'm talking about the whole place saw the church looking like it was on fire. And I'm sitting there like surely to God. Somebody else has seen this. Sister Ruth says, there's the glory. There's the glory. She wasn't, she wasn't uh, poised and uh, what's another word I could use? She wasn't uh, darling like uh, Catherine Cool. 
she is big. And she just will wave those big old arms. That's the glory. And all of a sudden I'm playing. And I look down, Brother Jerry, and one half of my black suit is solid gold. You say, how can that happen? Because when God does new things, well, I've never seen that. That's why it's a new thing. Well, I've heard that God can do things. Well, that's a new thing. When church was over, Brother Jones says, hey, can you come back tomorrow? I said, I'll, I will be here. He said, I got a better idea. Why don't you come spend the night at my house? Go home, get your stuff, come back to my house because Sister Ruth is going to be at Daystar tomorrow and I want you to be with her. I said, okay. So I drive home three hours from Greenville to where we lived. Got my stuff, got back, got to Brother Jones like 2 o'clock in the morning. At 5 o'clock in the morning, he's knocking on the door. Hey, wake up. My wife cooked breakfast. We need to eat. We got to get at the TV station early. We stop at sister at the hotel. Is it all right I'm telling you this? Are you still with me? We stop at the hotel, pick Sister Ruth up. I get out. I get in the front. She said, no, I want you to sit back here with me. You remind me of somebody. I want you to sit right beside me. She said, I think you're a co. Is your last name co? I said, no, ma'am. She said, oh, there's something about you that reminds me of Jack Coe. Little did she know I had, would sit for hours at Jack Coe's wife's, Sister Juanita's house. For hours, I would see things in that house that came from the great Philadelphia crusade and the great Brooklyn crusade. And I'd hear these stories and these accounts firsthand from the woman who was there. Her husband was the man. Then God blessed me to, for years to travel with their son, Jack Jr. And I watched women that have tumors the size of basketballs on the front of their stomachs. For him to say, when's God going to heal you? And they'd say, right now. And he'd double up his fist and punch that tumor as hard as he could. And when those women would scream and fall out, stand back up, it looked like they'd had a fat surgery because they'd lost about 80 pounds where that tumor had left their body. I can't count how many times we gathered up hearing aids in trash bags. Eyeglasses in trash bags. I can't count how many times people would walk in who had been crippled and lame and never walked, and he'd jerk them out of wheelchairs, take their crutches, and throw them across the room and watch those people run, never stop running. Sister Ruth didn't know that, and I said, well... I know this family. I've, I've been part of this family. Oh, okay. Because there's a residue of that family on your life. And my mom and daddy worked for them. I knew them. So I want you to sit right here by me. Sitting in her lap, she says, you see this Bible? I say, yes, ma'am. This is my great-grandmother's Bible. My great-grandmother was born at the Azusa Mission in a tent during the Azusa revival. She said, you know why I keep this revival, this Bible with me everywhere I go? I said, no, ma'am. She said, because every time I have this Bible, the glory of God shows up. And I may be telling you something that you think is far out, but I'm just going to tell you, I've witnessed these things with my eyes, and I want to see them again. Yeah. And in this generation, they would be new. God, in the church age of the Pentecostal church, miracles would be a new thing. Yeah. Baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, would be a new thing in the generation of the Pentecostal church right now. Yeah. We get the day star. They say, Marcus Lamb says, Sister Ruth, come sit down on the couch and we'll interview you in just a little while. So she says to me, here. Hold my purse. Anybody know what a granny purse is? It's that one with the handle about this long, and then the, the thing is about the size of a shopping cart. I mean, it's giant. 
So I'm holding her purse and she said, here, hold my grandmother's Bible. So I'm holding this Bible, holding her purse on my arm and holding her Bible in my hand. And Sister Ruth is sitting on this couch, way low. No big person ought to have to be sitting that low to the ground. And Marcus says, Sister Ruth, he's sitting across from her about this far. Sister Ruth, what's this I hear about gold showing up in your services? She said, well, it's gold. Sometimes it's gold dust. Sometimes it's gems. And she said, matter of fact, I was at Carlos Anaconda's church in Argentina and precious stones fell all over the church. So much that people took them to diamond jewelers and cashed them in and paid their houses off and brought the money back and paid the church off and said, so not only is it that, sometimes hot bread shows up. He said, hot bread. Yeah, little loaves of bread, little balls of sweet honey bread show up. And when people eat them, they take their glasses off and their heel. They pull their hands out. And I'm just standing over there like, holy macaroni, what did I get into? You know, I just saw gold last night. I can't deny that, but what am I getting into? And Sister Ruth, he says, Sister Ruth, now, some people might say that's a little strange. And Sister Ruth said, look, all I know is that if we start singing and we get into the presence of God, we'll translate from one level of atmosphere to another level of atmosphere. And the glory of God will come down and heaven will kiss the earth and we'll see the effects of it in our service and while she's talking Marcus Lamb's wife who's sitting to the right of him or the left of him says Marcus oh my God your suit is covered in gold and I was like a cartoon character I was like whoa 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 I looked over at him and this guy's clothes is just glittering with coat he leaps up and says sister Ruth pray for me now and sister Ruth starts waddling trying to get to the edge of her chair of that couch she can't get up she finally scoots to the edge and she waves her hand at him and live on television Marcus Lamb like a tree boom hits the ground she waves her hand at Joni boom she slides out of the chair goes to the ground she waves towards the congregation or the the not the congregation what do you call it the audience people are falling to the ground people are on the phone heads fell over cameramen sliding down to the ground I look around the room brother Jones myself the main cameraman, we're the only three people standing. I'm holding that little Bible, and that little Bible has gold coming out the end of it. I was telling Nathan this story yesterday. It looks like a water faucet. It's coming out, Pastor, so hard until it has it has built up a pile about a foot or a foot and a half tall. It's just pouring out of it. I look at Brother Jones, and I say, what are we supposed to do, Brother Jones said? We ain't doing nothing. Don't move. Just stand right there. It's like, do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? He said, don't move that Bible. Hold on. Don't stop. Just stand right there. For weeks and months after that, I'd be getting ready to preach. I'd open up my Bible, Pastor, and my Bible would be covered with so much gold. I would say to the congregation, I want everybody to come up here and look. I'd be preaching. And I'd walk by somebody and they would say, Pastor, there's gold all over your suit. You know what happens that people begin to mock that. Yeah. It's not real because I can't make it make sense in my mind. Here's the great thing. Faith never makes sense. Never. But sense will never produce faith. You'll get that when you get home. I am living now. I feel like sometimes a dinosaur relic in this generation. 
having seen the things I've seen, and yet I want to see them again until it burns on the inside of me. In 2019, I was in, I was in, I had preached for almost a month in Nigeria from the top to the south to the east to the west. I flew to Cote d'Ivoire where they only speak French. And I preached, I flew there and started preaching the night I got there and I preached 11 nights there. Got on a plane, flew to Ghana, preached the night I got in Ghana, preached five nights there. I was gone from home almost two months without being at home. And on the second night that I was in Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast, I'm preaching and the interpreter is interpreting. And right where Brother Jerry is sitting, there was a blind lady who was sitting on the streets like blind Barnabas begging. And they had led her into the church. On the back row back there where the deacon is sitting, there was a young man who was 20-something who had been born lame. He was damaged while they were taking him out of his mother and had never walked from his waist down, was lame from the minute he was born. And they would drive him to church. The guys in church would carry him inside and set him in a chair. Every service, this is the way he lived his life. And I'm preaching and the interpreter is interpreting. And I was preaching about the power of God is present. The power of God is present. The power of God is present. And while I'm preaching, this blind lady stands up and she starts speaking something in French. She's shouting it. She's shouting it in French. And I look to the interpreter and I say, what she say? And the interpreter is crying so hard till he can't even speak. And I'm screaming at him, what she say? And all of a sudden in perfect English, the, the, the lady from Cote d'Ivoire says, I can't see. When she shouted, I could see that young man leaped to his feet and ran five miles to his home. Showed his mother that he could walk and started running back to the church. That place packed the next night until it filled this already big church to capacity. They set one tent outside. They set a second tent outside up to the church. They set a third tent as far as you could see. There was people. On the third night there, the witch doctor shows up. He's standing across the road in full tribal. He's got his long mask on. Looks like wearing nothing but a loincloth. Little fuzzy things around his ankle. Fuzzy things around his hands. This guy's little, looks like a gourd. Y'all know what a gourd, y'all live in Oklahoma, you know what a gourd is. Looks like a gourd full of, I don't know, beads or something. And he's standing out there shaking it. And the church goes crazy. They come in screaming one word that no matter where you are in Africa, that word means the same thing. You can say God, everybody knows what that means. You can say Jesus, everybody knows what that means. But if you're in Africa and they say Juju, you know what that means. It means witchcraft. And they come in screaming Juju, Juju. And I'm standing there at the, on the preacher's seats, you know, like up here. And I look out there and I can see him stand across the street. I, 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 and I go to the sound man and I say, turn this microphone up as loud as it will go. And they turn that mic as loud till it was going, Wee! you know how it squeals because you're right. And I took off walking. And I walked through the middle of that church, through the middle of the first tent, middle of the second tent, middle of the third tent. And when I got outside the third tent, I started pointing just like this. And I said, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And when I got to the road where he was standing, when I stepped on the road, that witch doctor hollered, ah! And he ran into the bush so far you couldn't see him. That church began to reach choice and every miracle you can imagine took place that night and the glory of God showed up yeah. when God is ready to do something new he doesn't need the church world to vote yes he says I will do a new thing maybe it's not televised 
Maybe it's not Facebook because maybe God does it so that no one can get the glory but him. Man, I'm so far off my notes. Maybe God does it in such a way. No one can get the glory but him. Let me give you this revelation God showed me this morning. So these ten lepers show up at the feet of Jesus. They're praising and they're worshiping. And Jesus says to them, hey, go show yourselves to the priest. You know this story? And as they went, somebody say, as they went. As they went, two different words in the King James. One says cleansed. One says healed. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, they got what they needed. So it don't matter which word you want to use. They mean the same. They got what they needed. But all of a sudden, one realizes it's not enough just that I got what I needed. He comes back. And when he gets to where Jesus is, the Bible says that he did something with a loud voice. This is exactly King James. With a loud voice, he glorified God. Sitting there in the hotel today, God said to me, that's why we cannot muzzle someone's praise. That's why we cannot judge somebody's worship. That's why we cannot condemn someone who cannot keep their seat and cannot keep quiet. You don't know what they've went through to be where they are. You don't know what God has done in their life to get them where. I want to ask you on this Sunday morning, has God done anything for you that's worthy of a loud voice and praise? Let me ask you again. Has God done something for you that no one else could? And with a loud voice, you can praise him. Sit down just a minute. I'm going to be finished. Nine were healed, but one was made whole. Did you get that? Nine were cleansed. But one, the word whole is restored. But one was restored. One son had been faithful his whole life. But one was restored back to sonship. The English language restored is reinstated or returned or to bring back. But in the language from the Bible, the word restored means to put back the way God intended it to be from the beginning. Nine were cleansed. Nine were healed. Leprosy was gone. But one was restored. That word restored is the word I found this so powerful this morning. That word restored in the Greek is the word sozo, S-O-Z-O. It's also the same word for saved. (laughs) I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to those who are saved. For the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish, but to those who are saved, sozo, that word means to be rescued from danger and destruction. But you cannot truly understand sozo Unless you take Sozo's twin word, soteria, salvation. To be saved and I've received salvation. Nothing lacking, nothing broken, nothing missing. Wholeness and completeness, peace and prosperity. Nine were cleansed, but one receives nothing broken, nothing missing. Nothing lacking. My God in heaven, I feel the Holy Ghost. Nothing missing. Peace and prosperity. Not enough just to attend church on Sunday morning. I want something that there's nothing lacking. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. I don't just want to live life existing, sucking in breath, Jerry, and breathing it out. I want to live this God life of nothing lacking and nothing missing and nothing broken and wholeness and completeness and peace and prosperity. 
God is doing something new. Let me wrap up. He said, I will give you water in the wilderness. Everybody say water in the wilderness. The Hebrew word for, for water is midbar. It does not make wilderness to be some forsaken abyss. That's how it's been preached all these years. If you're in the wilderness, you're in the, but if you're in the place of midbar, it's like being in Goshen. Hell can be breaking out in Egypt. But if you've made your way to Goshen, the plague can't touch you in Goshen. <laughs> Everyone can be sleeping with the frogs in Egypt, but if you're in Goshen, you're sleeping like a baby at night. Blood, the water can be turned to blood in Egypt, but if you're in Goshen, it's still cool, clear water. He said, I will cause you to have a water in the wilderness in Midbar. The Hebrew word for Midbar, this blesses me, is, is a pasture where cattle are driven and led to graze. It's not some God forsaken place. God is not leading you to some forsaken place that you have to say, God, where are you? You don't ever have to ask God where he is. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. A lot of times we walk out in those places on our own, but God is not leading us or driving us into those places because he does not leave us. He does not forsake us. He sticks closer than a brother to us. He said in Psalm 23, he's our shepherd and we shall not want. He makes us to lie down in green pastures. He leads us. Somebody say he leads us. Besides still waters, he restores our souls. So the proof that God is doing something new is, is when it springs forth, here's the evidence. I will make a way. I will make a road. I will carve out a path that is so undeniably me that all you can do is stand there and say, this is the Lord's. And it is marvelous. In our eyes, I can't take credit for the people who've got up out of wheelchairs. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in my eyes. I can't take credit for when blind people have received their sight. I'm not a doctor. I didn't do a surgery on them. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. I was preaching in Arkansas right over by Fort Smith. And I said, there's someone in here that every night you go to sleep at night, you feel like it's the night you're going to die. I'm here to tell you you're not going to die, but you're going to live. And whoever that is, I want you to raise your hand. And I want to, want to pray for you. And I want to rebuke the, the spirit of fear off of your life. And an older gentleman raised his hand. And when he raised his hand. He got up and he walked down. And he says, every night I have to sleep with the CPAP machine on, my, on, my, on me. Because I have that so bad till I literally stop breathing. And the doctor said, I die. If I don't sleep with this machine on, I will die at night. And I said, I'm going to rebuke the spirit of fear off of you. And you will never again have to be afraid of dying at night. And right then, the pastor stood up and he walked over to that man. And he said, do you know I love you? And the man said, yes. And he said, I'm going to tell you something that I don't tell people. But I'm going to tell you right in front of this preacher tonight. He said, God spoke to me and said, if you'll plant a seed in this preacher's hand tonight... You won't never have to sleep with that machine ever again. And listen, I don't take my own offerings unless I'm asked to. I don't prophesy for money. I don't preach about, I preach about tithes and offerings. I believe just what the pastor preached. But I don't go to a church to prophesy so I can build a big offering. That's God. God will take care of me. Even when they cut the offerings, God will still take care of me. Amen. 
And so I'm standing there like this has to be God because God knows I wouldn't tell that man sow a seed to me. And, you know, so this man pulls out his billfold and he starts digging inside of it. And he pulls some money out. And when he does, his wife stands up from the back row and she shouts, all of it. So he pulls his billfold back out and he opens it up and he, I watch him take all of it out. And she says, even your folded money. He reaches down behind a little compartment in his billfold. Oh, come on, men. You know what I'm, t- you men know what I'm talking about. He pulls this out. He starts counting 100, 200, 300, 400. I'm just like, dear God. I don't think I've ever had that much money folded up in my billfold as he's counting out. He just keeps on counting hundreds. And the preacher said, the pastor says, now lay it in that preacher's hand. He lays it in my hand. And when I pray for him, I'm telling you, my hands were so on fire till it felt like they were going to burn off my wrist, Jerry. When I was 12 years old, W.V. Grant Sr., the pastor of the Eagle's Nest, not Junior that you see on TV, on television, but his dad, W.V. Sr., he held a six-week revival at my mom and dad's church every night for six weeks. And on the last night, he said, who in this place is called to preach? And I got up from the front row beside my mom, 12 years old, and I walked down to the front, and my dad and all the other old men were, like, pushing me back, like, get step back, you know, this W.V. Grant, step back, you know, let all the men get up here because the people were piling in because they knew he was going to pray for him. And he stops everyone and he says, bring that boy up here to me. And unlike a lot of pastors, we like to fellowship as I'm a pastor. We like to fellowship with evangelists. He would come in just in time for church, preach, get in a car. He had a driver. They would drive him straight back to Dallas. He didn't want to know anyone. He didn't want to talk to anyone. He didn't want to know what anyone was going through. He didn't want to know what anyone had going on. And that guy would prophesy so clear every night. He would say to people, you went to the doctor today, and the doctor told you this and this and this and this. He, it was so accurate, and all, everything was, you know, not, well, you want more love in your life. No, we, are, we do want more love. But this was totally accurate, every single thing. He says, bring that boy up here. My mom pushed me. I walked up there. He said, little boy, hold your hands out. Twelve years old, I hold my hands out. He took my hands and he grabbed hold of my hands and he said, from this point on in your life, you will know when the miraculous healing power of God is on your life because your hands are going to burn like they're falling off your your, uh, arms. He said, and you're going to know when that happens that God is going to touch whoever that you touch with those burning hands. And I have seen that from the age of 12 right now to the age of 53. I have seen that over and over again that God has performed miracle after miracle after miracle when that thing would happen. So when that man is standing there before me, I have cash in one hand. That's totally against my personality. But I was saying, God, this has to be you. You know who I am. And I took this other hand that's now shaking. I don't even, it it must be the glory of God. I took this hand and I laid it on his head. It felt like my hand was 180 degrees. I laid it on his head. And this man, when I took my hand from his head, my hand was so hot, he had red marks on his head. He falls out, huge man, falls out and hits the floor. When he gets up, he says, well... I guess you'll know if I got healed if I'm at revival tomorrow night. And I said, okay. And when church was over, the pastor said, well, this is either going to be a miracle or this is going to be a disaster. I said, why? He said, because that man is not going to wear his mask when he goes to sleep tonight. And I'm telling you, when I got back to the hotel... I prayed, I did not sleep one ounce 
I'm not kidding you. I travailed. I cried out to God. I prayed. I said, Lord, if I be a man of God, I'm begging you. I'm begging you, God, please, you've got to let this man live. Lord, you know, I just could not imagine. You know, it's like, hey, it's okay when you say, hey, God's going to do this. But when they say, oh, but, but you, here's something that if I be a man of God, this thing has to happen. What's the test of a prophet? Does it come to pass? And so the next night we're having church. Church has started. He's not there. I'm just like on the front row praying in tongues. I'm like, dear God, what's going on? Praying in tongues. All of a sudden him and his wife come in. They started a song. I don't remember what it is, but all of a sudden his wife comes shouting down to the front, running around the building. He's standing up. He's hot. Wow! Big old Indian. Wow! And finally she makes a lap around. The pastor grabs her. He said, why are you shouting and dancing like you are? She said, last night we lay down in bed. And my husband said, honey, I do believe that God healed me. And she said, she said, so do I. And he reached over and he grabbed his mask. And she said, she said, she took it from his face and said, but honey, you ain't going to need this tonight. And he said, what if I don't wake up? She said, kiss God right on the lips and said, then I'll see you in heaven. <laughs> Not long after that, I saw the man. His testimony was this. I'm still sleeping without that mask. God doesn't need us to do something for him but yield. I've talked to you about some things that are way out there. But guess what? God wants to do that in the church. Not tomorrow, not next month, not next year, not with another evangelist, not with another pastor. He wants to do it now in our generation. We are the people that God wants to do it through. Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. Don't do it without me. How many of you really want God to manifest His glory in your life? His presence in your life? I want you to stand up. Nathan, could you come over there? You can go to the keyboard, the organ, whichever one you want to go to. Oh man, I don't even know what time it is. I've preached past looking at the clock. I did tell Nathan, however, church doesn't start till 7, so that must mean we are okay to have a good service this morning. I'm starting to realize I'm fixing to plant a church right in the middle of Oklahoma City. That's God's plan for us. And I already told my family, we're starting church at 7 o'clock on Sunday nights so that we can have all the church we want on Sunday morning. I want God to do the miraculous. The undeniable. I watched that sister Ruth, that little lady. I watched her take a chair, Jerry, and sit on the edge of the stage. And as people walked by, she took gold and brushed it off of her body. And she laid it on their heads. And a man walked up. His, he had been a drug addict. He'd been an alcoholic, but he'd been a drug addict. And he had, his testimony was he had shot needles in his hands and his arms and his toes and his fingers. Anywhere he could shoot them, he took so much drugs till his teeth were black and rotten out. And Sister Ruth leaned over to this man who was crying and weeping and said, How would you like God to do a miracle for you? Just sitting on the edge of the stage, just sitting in a chair right at the edge of the stage. And he said, yes, ma'am, I want God to do anything he wants to do for me. She said, would you like God to give you some new teeth? Oh, I hope I don't lose you right now. He said, yes, ma'am. And I'm thinking Sister Ruth's going to give him the money to go get some dentures. But Sister Ruth says, let me get some of this glory off of me. And she wipes the sweat off her head she wipes it across that old grandma dress looked like the little house on the prairie is what it looked like 
She wipes that old sweaty, glistening gold hand on this guy's face. Starts at his head. She wipes it down his face. When she gets to his neck, he goes like this. And the man starts sitting there crying and speaking in tongues. Where I'm sitting at the piano, I'm looking straight at him. Pastor, I can see his mouth open. I'm looking right at him. And all of a sudden, his mouth begins to fill up with so much foam. It looks like somebody took old Barbasol shaving cream and squirted it in his mouth. Cool Whip squirted in his mouth until his whole mouth is full of foam. He can't even speak. He's sitting there crying. And, oh. and while he's standing there, Sister Ruth just keeps saying, that's all right, son. That's the glory. That's the glory. She keeps praying for other people while he's standing there, his mouth full of foam. It's okay. That's the glory. That's the glory. Praying for people. People are falling out. People are just shouting, dancing, running. And he's standing there, oh, mouth full of foam. I don't know how long it went on. It felt like an eternity, but it probably wasn't. But that's how it felt like. And all of a sudden, Sister Ruth says, young man, close your mouth. God is creating a miracle in your mouth. And he closed his mouth. And she said, now open your mouth and rejoice in the God. And when he opened his mouth, it looked like brand new, looked like denture straight from the dentist. Brand new teeth, a mouthful of brand new teeth. My son will tell you, I don't tell these stories everywhere I go because most people can't handle these stories. But I think I found myself in a place today that is tired of standing on the bank throwing mud at one another. And I think I found myself in a group of people today that are ready to be as deep in the water of God as we can be until God can do what only God can do. Not a place that we're starving and we're dying of thirst, but a place where green pastures is our supply. Nathan, let's sing. Oh, the glory of your presence. Can we put a mic on this boom for Nathan? Can we do that? We As your presence now fills this place. Come on, sing it. Oh, the glory. Yeah, go ahead. Glory. Come on, he's in this place right now. God is about to explode right now. We, your people. Come on, sing that thing. We give you reverence. We give you reverence. Come on, lift your hands to heaven and say, So arise. So arise from.
Have you any mountains that you can't tunnel through? Have you any rivers you can't cross? God specializes in things that are impossible. He will do what no other can do. You need God to do something in your life. Lift up holy hands. Oh, but I want you to lay hands on me right now. I want you to get in the glory. So deep in the glory, you're beyond needing someone to touch you. Someone to speak to you. You're in the place where God. He is able to do what no other can do. Lord, I thank you for the manifestation of miracles in this place right now. I thank you that while they're standing there, you're healing shoulders and necks and backs and arms and legs and hips. Yeah, Lord, I hear that. You're healing hips right now. Been a hurting to bend over, been a hurting to stoop down, been a hurting to sit down, been a hurting to stand up. If that's you, put your hands down. Everybody put your hands down. If you've been hurting in your hips, hold your hands up right now. All of you with your hands raised, I want you to begin to exercise your faith. I want you to begin to twist from side to side. I want you, if you feel comfortable, to reach over and bend down and reach over and lean back. I want you to see that God is touching your body right now. Lord, I faintly see your hand. Lord, I thank you for touching these hips right now. I thank you that all pain is gone. I thank you, God, for the manifestation of miracles right now. I thank you for touching mother right now. Thank you, Lord, for the healing, the gift of healing right now. Thank you, Lord, for flowing through her hips right now, taking all the pain away. Was there somebody here in the middle that raised your hand? Your hips have been hurting. Was there somebody? There was somebody besides the two of them. Is that you, Mother? Go ahead and just move your hips. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Can I pray for you? Let me just agree with you. God's already touching you right now, Lord. Thank you for touching her. Thank you, Lord, for touching her right now. In the name of Jesus. Glory, 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 glory. Glory, 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 glory. Oh, there it is, Father. There's your glory. There it is. That's your glory. Lord, all pain, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let the pain be gone. Never to return. Never to return. Never to return. One more time before we turn to the pastor, say, Oh, oh, oh. I believe you're my portion. I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. Jesus, you're.
you're glad today that Jesus is in our midst. He knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the Lord. No, not one. Oh, no, not one. Let me say this and I'm going to quit. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, our sin and grief. A privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what needs we often forfeit? Come on, sing it. Clap your hands and give the Lord a big praise, everybody. Pastor. Oh, are you glad that you're in the presence of Jesus this morning? Hallelujah. How many senses tangible anointing here? I can tell you, you know, when that anointing hits, church, as usual, stops. People will say, why do you act a certain way that you act when you're different in these services? It's because when that anointing comes, he transforms you yeah. into a different person. Hallelujah. Well, I am anticipating how many are excited about tonight's service. Um, you will need to, we'll have more chairs out, and you will need to get here early to get a seat. I promise you that. And uh, we want to also just let you know, uh, that you don't want to miss tonight's service. It's more important than anything you would do tonight. 
Some of you said, Pastor, I don't know about some of the things I've heard. Let me tell you something. He's doing a new thing. <laughs> I said, God's doing a new thing. And if you're hungry and thirsty and you're tired of the same old, same old, how many with a lifted hand, before we go, we'll let you go, say, Pastor, I'm hungry for God to do a new thing. And I believe that he can and that he will in Jesus' name. Lift up your hands all over this place. Let's not be ungrateful for what God has done in this house. Every head bowed, every hand lifted. And I feel the Holy Ghost saying to do this before we leave. If there's anyone, any soul, any man or woman that says, you know, I've heard these things and I cannot help but feel and I can't deny what I've felt and sensed in this service. My friend, that's Jesus. That's the presence of God that you feel now, even now. Christians, would you begin to speak in tongues? Pray with me. Pray in the Spirit. And if you're a soul in this place and you say, I want God. I want Him. I am tired of the way life has been. I want Him to do a new thing in me. My friend, if that's you and you know you're away from Jesus, I want you to get out of your seat and meet me at this altar. I want prayer warriors to come. Meet me down here. I want people to come. If you're an usher, if you're on our team, I want you to come. Stand right here with me. God's dealing with people. And I'm telling you, he's whipping Hosanna into shape. We got to get ready. Be ready for what's coming. If God is speaking to you, you know who you are. I will not embarrass you in any way, but you must make a decision to follow Jesus. If you are lost and you say, that's me, I need Jesus this morning. I want you to get out of your seat, be man or woman enough to meet me down at this aisle. And come, if you need Jesus in your life, you say, I'm a sinner. I'm away from God. I've allowed the things of this world that Bishop Mark was talking about. I've been in the pig pen. I want you to get out of your seat now. Just moments, moments, moments are passing. You might not have another moment in time. You might not have another service to attend. Come on, give them a big God bless you as they come. Let them know that they're welcome. Welcome, 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 welcome. If there's anybody else, if there's anybody else, I want you, members of Hosanna, to get out of your seat and gather around these people. Get out of your seat. Be the church. You've cried, you've prayed, you've asked God to use you. Now he's saying, come. Is this what you want? God's giving you a chance. I feel the presence of the Lord. Their lives will never be the same. Eternity is hanging in the balance. If you are not right with Jesus, I don't care what kind of name, even if you're a Christian, even if you attended a church, God doesn't care where you attend church or what kind of person you've called yourself to be. If you're away from him, if you are in need of his mercy and his grace today, if you've allowed sin into your life, I want you to get down here now. You might not have another day. You might not have another moment. You might not have another opportunity. This is your moment. Heaven is calling you home. 
Some of you have been away from God. I'm going to tell you like it is. Some of you have been grown cold and indignant to the things of God. And you need to repent as any sinner on the street. So if you're that person. I don't care if you're a deacon in this church, if you're away from God, if you're not in love with Jesus, if this makes you uncomfortable, I want you to come down to this altar this morning and rededicate some things. Get your life right. I don't want you to look up to me in heaven and say, Pastor Chris, why didn't you warn me? I'll wait a few more moments. God is moving. He's dealing with hearts. This young man just told me something. Listen to me. Bishop, he just told me he hasn't darkened the door of a church since his father passed away. This service, brother, was for you. Paul, this service was done for you this morning. Wasn't done for anybody else. Your life is never going to be the same, brother. I want you to know Jesus tells me to tell you. He's not mad at you. He never was. He loves you more than you would ever begin to understand. And as a minister of the gospel, I'm telling you, you can take this to the bank. God loves you. He's got a plan for your life. You ain't seen nothing yet. The best is yet to come. I want you to lift your hands right now. Stretch them this way. This young man will never be the same. Sister, your life will never be the same from this moment forward. Your life will never be the same from this moment forward. Your life will never be the same. Masataha kahataya okoloto. Your life will never be the same. The enemy would have you. The devil has come to destroy you, to take your soul to a devil's hell. But I'm here to tell you this morning, John, this is your moment for a life change, a shifting, because it gets hellacious before. It gets good sometimes. And the Lord wants me to tell you, this is your moment. Are you going to pray this prayer with me? And everything in your marriage is about to shift. Come on, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, he's in this house. He's in this house. And every eye... Every person, take note. We're getting ready to pray a prayer. And if you'll pray this prayer, mean it with your heart. God, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, it will come inside of your spirit and change you from the inside out. And heaven will become your eternal home. Are you ready? Are you ready? Say this prayer with me and mean it with all of your heart. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I come to you now. In need of your mercy, in need of your grace. I am a sinner. I need your Savior. So, right now, according to your word, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come in and wash me. Create in me a clean heart. I renounce sin. I repent from every wicked way. Forgive me, Lord Jesus. You said in your word, if I would believe with my heart and confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, I would be saved. So based upon the truth of your word and my faith in your word, I confess you now. Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. Come in, Lord Jesus. Have your way in me. Fill me now with the Holy Ghost. I'll serve you all the days of my life. And I'll live in your house forever. 
I am saved. Somebody shout glory. Somebody shout. Oh, oh, hey. Wow, glory to God. Son of the Bacosa, fill him with the Holy Ghost. Hey, son of the Bacado. Sapahaya, Sapakorabaya. In the name, in the name, in the name. If ushers, you aren't ready. We're going to begin to pray for people. Ha 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, isn't it good in here? Hallelujah. Ha 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 ha. Oh, Samana Ikana ha ha ha. Come on, somebody, lift your voice. In the name of Jesus, I break every demon power over you. Go! I declare you're free this morning, John. You're free this morning from everything the devil's tried to lie and to steal and to kill and destroy. I decree and declare life in Jesus' name. Come on. See, y'all don't know what's gone on behind closed doors, but I do. And I'm telling you, today is the new day for the rest of their life. It's the best. Hallelujah. Glory to God. This is the first day of the rest of their life. Ha, ha, ha. Somebody shout. Hey. Oh, ha, ha, ha. See, we've not come here to just be church. We've not come here just to do things as normal. I'm tired of normal. I'm sick of the status quo. I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Brother. Hallelujah. 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 I hear the Lord saying, if you'll lift your hands right now, Brother Paul, you're my brother. See, you've now entered the kingdom of God. The Holy Ghost wants to come on the inside of you. Now, he lives in you now in a measure, but there's another experience beyond salvation. Now, I'm going to tell you, it sounds a little strained to the mind. But when I touch you this next time, you're going to feel a power come on you and want to get in you. And you're going to want to speak an unknown language. Just open your mouth like Bishop said and yield to God. Are you ready? And when that language comes forth, you receive a holy power to live the right life that God wants you to live. I'm telling you this morning, you're going to set this region on fire. God's going to use this young man to reach those that I could never reach. He's going to use him. Shalabahaka. One. You ready? I'm going to touch you on the head. Whoa. Two. Three. Jesus, fill him with the hope. Somebody, Get me some oil. For the Spirit of God would say to this church, you see, I'm moving upon those that were in the pigsty. I'll pass by the religious cold crowd to get to one that knows they need me. And I'll use one to set a thousand to fly. Oh, Shippi Kotaha, Solomoto Hoka. I will not pass this generation by, says the Spirit of God. 
And brother, every addiction is broken off of your life this morning. I'm going to anoint you with oil. And this is a sign of the Holy Spirit on your life. In Jesus' name. Yes. <laughs> Never the same. He's going to put some of us to shame. I hear the Lord say he's coming with men and women on his shoulders. I see him bringing them in. Bringing them in. Look, if one can set a thousand. God don't need a religious person. He's not looking for a perfect Christian. He's just looking for somebody to say, here am I. Use me. He don't care how long you sat in a church pew. He doesn't care if you on a daily basis struggle. He's looking to use the broken. God will pass over a million Christians to find somebody slung out in a ditch somewhere. And he'll say, hey, you know, I have use for you. We've got to get a hold of this. Shabahokia Tahaya. Come on, let's lift our hands and worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Holy, holy. Come on, say it with me before we go. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. It's <laughs> He's omniscient. He's in this place. I'm telling you, I don't know what's about to happen this week, but I wouldn't miss one moment of these meetings. Glory to God. Shelebahataya. Holy. Holy. Everybody stand to your feet. Holy. Holy. Let's reverence God the Holy Ghost for what he's done in our midst this morning. Glory to God. Whoa! Oh. You are Alpha and Omega. We worship you, our Lord. You are worthy. To be praised, you are Alpha and Omega. We worship, we worship you. We give you all the glory. We worship you, our Lord. Isn't he worthy? You are worthy to be praised one more time we worship we give you Come on, put your hands together for Jesus one last time. Allah Batanda Hakataha.
Oh, I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus. Well, heaven is rejoicing. Is this what you're hungry for? Nod your head if this is what you're hungry for. Paul, never the same. As a church together, we're going to agree with this man, and we're going to say, thank you for the help. We're just going to say that together in agreement with him. Thank you, God. Thank you for the help. Thank you for the help. Hallelujah. Thank you for the help. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I like that. Thank you for the help. He's an ever-present help. I don't know about you, but I'm hungry to see the glory. We're going to let you go. Expect the unexpected. Tonight will be a night that you don't want to miss. I think we're in the glory this morning. How many will bring a visitor with you tonight? Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad two people will do the best they can to get somebody here. Because you see, if you'll get people in an atmosphere like this, God will touch them. He'll do the work. He'll do the work. But you've got to find people that are willing to cut a hole in a religious roof, to stop the cycle of life, to get them to Jesus. I'm glad I've got some crazy friends that have gotten me to Jesus before. Didn't care what people thought about them. Amen. Be the crazy friends. And come back tonight at 7 p.m. And uh, you will be changed. Let's lift up both hands to heaven as a sign of thankfulness to God. Father, we love you and we pray. We know that you have been blessed by watching the broadcast today. So thank you so much for watching. If you would like to become a partner with us, go to ChristopherLynn.org and sow a seed today. I promise you, you will be blessed. Now remember, stay in the secret place.